morning and welcome to Low Country Community Church. I'm Jeff Cranston, the lead pastor. And I'm so glad y'all are here. Service will be starting soon and trust me, you're not going to want to miss one second of this. Parents, there's still plenty of time to get your kids checked in at LCC Kids. They are in great hands and I promise they're going to have a great time today. And so as you're finding your seat, please take a second and silence your cell phones. But parents, keep them handy, just in case our children's staff needs to text and get a hold of you. Today, we have a special message from our friend Marquis Laughlin from Acts of the Word Ministries. Marquis has been a friend of our church for many years, and his presentation of the Word is unique, compelling, and incredibly interesting. Our service will be starting soon, but there's still time to finish your coffee before heading into the main auditorium. When you're finding your seat, please help make room for everyone by scooting toward the center of your row. Thanks again for being here. There's just a few minutes left, so if you haven't already, please find your seat. It's gonna be a great day. church this morning. We're so glad you've joined us today. We invite you to stand to your feet and let's sing together.
in. Y'all can have a seat. Well, my name is Jason. I'm the executive pastor. I want to welcome you to LCC. We're so glad that y'all are here worshiping with us today. Hey, if this is one of your first times here, we want you to know you're among friends. We'd also love to get to know you outside of this service. One of the easiest ways to make that happen is take out your cell phone right now and text the word, hey, LCC, that's all one word, to the number 99000. Then on your way out today, stop by our blue welcome tent outside. The folks there will know you're coming. They'll have a gift put aside for you just for being our guest here today. They'll also be glad to talk to you, answer any questions you may have, tell you about all the wonderful things that happen all week long and throughout the month ahead. So let me encourage you to do that if you're new. Well, can you believe July is almost over, which means the end of summer is coming soon and back to school is right around the corner. So that means we're in the middle of our annual back to school shoe drive, where together we are trying to provide a new pair of tennis shoes for boys and girls headed back to school. So if you've signed up to help us with that, let me just remind you, tomorrow is the deadline. We need to get those shoes dropped off here at the church no later than tomorrow. So we can begin counting and sorting them, making sure we have all the right numbers of sizes we need for the hundreds of kids who have signed up to get a pair of those shoes. If you haven't had a chance to shop yet or you haven't even signed up yet, it's not too late. We'll do your shopping for you. All you need to do is stop out at the missions tables out in the lobby in the concourse on your way out, make a contribution, or you can take your phone right now and text the word LCC shoes to that same 99000, make your contribution online, and we'll take care of buying those shoes for you. Well, our shoe distribution day is taking place on Wednesday, July 31st, and it's gonna be a lot of fun. Families will be coming in all day long. And it's a lot of fun for those of us that are here able to serve them because we see those boys and girls' faces lighting up as they get to go in and pick out a brand new pair of shoes to start the school year off right. Well, we wanna share that opportunity with you. So if you'd like to come and volunteer with us, we would love to have you be a part of that day. All you need to do is stop by our missions table again out in the concourse on your way out, and they'll get you signed up. Or you can take your phone out right now and text the word LCC serve, all one word to that same 99000, and we can get you signed up that way as well. Well, we're all in for a treat today. Our good friend, our longtime friend, Marquis Laughlin is back with us, and he is gonna be taking us on a journey through the Bible. And Marquis came to town a little early this time, and he headed out to Allendale Correctional Institution yesterday. And as I hope you know, Allendale is one of our local mission partners. So a portion of your giving every week goes to support outside ministry programs like Allendale's Character Restoration Initiative. That's a program that seeks to provide these inmates with the tools and skills they need to learn in order to be successful when they're released from prison. So as we get ready to continue worshiping through our giving, I just want to encourage you that your gifts really are making a difference in people's lives every day in countless different ways. But right now I'm going to ask you to stand back up with me and let's pray together to God this morning. Father God, thank you for bringing us in your house today to praise and worship you. Thank you for our wonderful worship team as they help us just lift our praises up to you, Father. Be with our friend Marquis as he comes to present your dynamic word. Let it touch hearts in a profound way today. Now we ask you to bless the offering we're about to receive. Help us be good stewards of it. Help us to use it for your glory to reach and train more people for you, God. Everything we do is because of you. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Now please remain standing and let's continue to worship and give together.
your church today that we get to stand here in this place to to sing praise to declare who you are and what you have done and God we are humbled by your love for us your pursuit of us your unending pursuit of your people and God today we ask for you to move and to speak through your word through your spirit We ask in faith that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear exactly what you have for us today. We believe you have a word for us and that you're calling us. 
And so we're here listening, ready and willing, whatever it is. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Go on and have a seat. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Now there came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Now he was in the world and though the world was made through him, The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, and yet his own did not receive him. But to all who received him, to everyone who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. See, we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. From the fullness of His grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters, they sent word to Jesus Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they replied, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there? Jesus answered them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, and I'm going there to wake him up. But Lord, his disciples said, if he sleeps, he he will get better. His disciples had thought he meant natural sleep, but Jesus had been speaking to them about his death. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad I was not there for your sake so that you may believe. But come, let us go to him. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. Now on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. When, Jesus, when Martha heard that Jesus had finally come, she went out to meet him. Lord, she said, if, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Well, I know he will rise again, said Martha, in the resurrection at the last day. Then Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who was to come into the world. Now, having said this, she then ran and called her sister Mary. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was, she fell at his feet weeping. Lord, she said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Once more deeply moved, he came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone rolled in front of the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by now there is a strong odor, for he has been there for four days. But Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked toward heaven and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. When he had said this, he then called in a loud voice toward the tomb, Lazarus, come out. dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. <laughs> Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had visited Jesus, uh, visited Mary and her sister Martha and had seen what Jesus did, well, they put their faith in him. But some of them went to the chief priest and the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So from that day on, the chief priest and the Pharisees plotted to take his life. Now, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and return to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Then he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled, and he testified, I tell you the truth. One of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of the disciples, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Then leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it into the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you're about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. My little children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. But Simon Peter replied, but Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered him, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth. 
before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Then Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. <laughs> so how can we know the way? Jesus answered him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Now, if you really knew me, you'd know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Then Philip said to him, Well, Lord, show us the Father. <laughs> That'll be enough for us. Jesus answered him, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time? Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Now, if you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father to give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, though the world does not know him, you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. And because I live, you also will live. See, on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Now, after Jesus had finished saying these things, he left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now, Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was about to happen to him, went out and said to them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, said Jesus. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. Now when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I told you that I am he, said Jesus. Since you are looking for me, then let these men go. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup? that the Father has given me. Then the detachment of soldiers arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. Well, Simon Peter and another disciple who, who was known to the high priest were following Jesus. Since this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Simon Peter had to wait outside of the door. So then the disciple who was known to the high priest went back, spoke to the girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You're not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. He denied it, saying, I am not. was cold, and the servants stood around a fire that they had made to keep warm. Simon Peter was also standing there with them, warming himself. Now, meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I was taught at the synagogues or, or the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. Now, when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why do you strike me? Then Caiaphas sent him to the 
palace of the Roman governor. Now, meanwhile, as Simon Peter stood warming himself, he was asked again. You're not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, <laughs> I am not. Another man, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, he denied it. And at that moment, a rooster crowed. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not want to enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them. What charges are you bringing against this man, he asked. If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Well, take him yourselves, Pilate said, and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. See, this happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. So then Pilate went back inside the palace and questioned Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews, Pilate asked. Is that your own idea, said Jesus, or did others talk to you about me? <laughs> Am I a Jew, Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priest who handed you over to me. What is it you've done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. So you are a king then, said Pilate. You are right in saying I'm a king, said Jesus. In fact, for this reason I was born. And for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. <laughs> what is truth? Huh? <laughs> and with this, Pilate went out again to the Jews and said to them, Look, I find no basis for charges against him. But... It is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner during the time of the Jewish Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? But they shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. So Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Ha! And they struck him in the face. <laughs> now once more, Pilate came out and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for charges against him. Now when Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. But they shouted back, take him away, take him away, crucify him. You take him and crucify him, Pilate said to them. As for me, I find no basis for charges against him. But we have a law, the Jews objected, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, He was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace and questioned Jesus. Where do you come from, Pilate asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate replied? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus replied, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the ones who handed me over to you are guilty of a greater sin. Now, from then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, if you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. Now, when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and he sat down at the place known as the stone pavement, the judge's seat. It was the day of preparation of Passover. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted back, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate replied. 
We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. And so the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place known as the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And there, they crucified him. With him, two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a nose prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Near the cross of Jesus stood Jesus' his mother, Mary, the wife of Clopas, his mother's sister, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus... saw his mother standing there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that day on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was nearby, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, he said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now the day on which Jesus was crucified was to be a special Sabbath. And because the Jews did not want the bodies kept on the crosses during the Sabbath, they they asked Pilate for permission to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. Well, the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers took a spear and pierced Jesus' side, bringing a a sudden flow of blood and water. See, these things happen so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones would be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. Now later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for permission to have the body of Jesus. Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had visited Jesus earlier at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it in the spices uh, with strips of linen. This is in accordance with Jewish burial customs. Now, near the cross of Jesus, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been placed. Because it was the day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now, very early on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene got up and went to the tomb, and she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and she said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Simon Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple reached the tomb first. He he bent over to look inside, but did not go in. Finally, Simon Peter arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had arrived first went inside. He saw and believed. Now, the disciples still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So then the disciples went back to their homes. Now, later on that first day of the week, When the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said to them. Then he showed them his nail-pierced hands and his wounded side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. 
Now, I've spoken about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day when he was taken up after he'd given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them, he presented himself alive after his suffering for 40 days, appearing to them for 40 days. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the gift of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said this, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And as they stood there gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them dressed in white robes. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here gazing into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you've seen him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem. Now, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as, as they had been enabled. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this, at this tumult, the, the multitude came together. And they said, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents from Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Persia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belong to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed, saying, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they are filled with new wine. <laughs> but Peter lifted up his voice and addressed them, saying, men of Israel, give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only nine in the morning. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show signs in the heavens above, and wonders on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty signs and wonders that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up, loosing the pains of death, for it was not possible to be, for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I might not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope 
for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness in your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. See, being therefore a prophet, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. See, having therefore been exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the gift of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the disciples, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children, for all who are far off, for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his words were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they committed themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, breaking of bread, and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And the Lord added to the number, day by day, those who were being saved. Now, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him. We ask you, brothers, to not become alarmed or quickly concerned by a word or a letter or a spirit seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. For that day will not come until the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one doomed to destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. See, the beast will be given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies, and he'll exercise his authority for three and a half years. He'll open his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. And he'll be given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he'll be given authority over every nation, tribe, people, and language. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the book of life, belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This calls for patience, endurance, and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Hmm? Then I saw an angel coming out of heaven. He called in a loud voice to him who was seated on the cloud. He said, take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So, he who was seated on the cloud, swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Then, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, bright and clean. 
Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the fury of the winepress of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried out in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair. He said, come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slaves, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him, the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Then I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast and had not received the mark of his name. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. See, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God. And he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And the bride say, come, and let him who hears say it, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. Whoever wishes, let him take the free gift. of the water of life. Best offer ever. How priceless is the water of life? That's what we have to share with the world. The most priceless thing in the universe. God's stewarding it with us. Pouring out his spirit through you and I to share his story. To share his love. To bring about his glory. 
You know, there's a lot going on that's wrong in this world right now. But the thing that's most unjust is that God's creation, Jesus' creation, that moves and breathes it only because he wills it to be, is not glorifying him. God's glory is so great that when all he's made doesn't glorify him, it's the wrongest thing in the universe. That's what Jesus is doing, reversing all of the curse. He's restoring God's creation to perfection. He's the only one who can take our lives and transform our past and our futures so that they glorify him and have meaning and significance. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Everything else is burning up, folks. I had the blessing of being able to go to uh, the Allendale uh, prison facility. My second trip, I was there yesterday. This was my, the second time I've been able to go, and I was able to share Acts of the Apostles, which I did a, a little bit here. Uh, just amazing. 183 men so excited to, uh, to have anybody care about them. They wrote three cards that they have for your church to thank you for enabling me to come. Uh, they they wrote, did a big mural canvas they put up behind me when I presented. They, they just rolled the red carpet out. The amazing believers, but forgotten by the outside world, forgotten by the church. Um, and God has a heart for that. As you know, Jesus told us, here's some things you should be doing. One of them was remembering Remember people though, that are in prison. Jesus came to die for sinners. And, and what a great place to share God's word and to offer the free gift of the water of life. What a blessing to be able to do it there. Um, spent 45 minutes after the presentation just doing a Q&A. They were so thirsty and hungry for God's word. I think sometimes we assume because of our hostile culture towards Christianity and the persecution we're starting to get for sharing our faith that no one wants to hear about the free gift of the water of life. But there are, there are other fishing holes, people. <laughs> there are people, there are places where the fish are jumping. That prison is one of them. Uh, another place, Guatemala, you guys just sent a group there. We were comparing notes. I just went in February. I visited a, uh, Lucas, one of the kids we sponsor as a family through Food for the Hungry. And um, it just blew me away when I went. Uh, I went with a couple other artists, and we, had, we all had kids sponsored uh, there. And we went to visit each one of the kids, and we went to their schools to see what we were doing in there and all of the programs that they were there to, to share who Jesus is with them and to transform their whole village and make it self-sufficient and make sure they get clean water and all the kids can stay in school. It was just, a, it was mind-blowing, but they treated us like kings. They, did a, they had a parade for us. They were throwing petals of flowers in front of us as we walked up to the school. It was like, huh? I mean, you know, you're like, huh, all right, okay. And, oh, you, you sit up there on this big platform and we're going to do all of this uh, a ceremony to welcome you. And it's three hours later. They had every, you know, all the groups come up and do an act and somebody else would come up. Oh, they made this special for you. And you're like, three hours later, okay, that was the welcome. But they're so grateful. They're praising God simply because we chose to think about them a little bit and it made such a huge significance in their life. You know, when I sat down with Lucas and his family, he's 10, Lucas wants to be a teacher. And he says, I want to come to America one day. I said, well, you can come and stay with me. You got a place to stay. And their whole family, their hope, wow. One of us can go to America. We, we know someone in America that we could stay with. It's like they know some wealthy guy you know, and, and I'm like, oh, okay, you know, but, but it's, it's hope. That's what Jesus is. He's in the hope business. We look at this world, it's fallen. Jesus is restoring it. He's ending all the injustice, all the things that are wrong. He's in that business of restoring hope, and he's doing a miracle in every one of us every day. 
And we have the ability to say, you know what? Yeah, maybe I can, I'm kind of thankful. Maybe I can help somebody else a little bit here. And we have no idea the huge, you know, the huge change in their life or their future and the praise they give to God, which is the rightest thing that results. And that's really what it is. Let your light shine before men so that they may see and glorify your Father in heaven. See your good works, glorify your Father in heaven. So if you've been touched, hey, we have some picture folders out there, kids with food for the hungry all over the world in the same situation that Lucas is in. Um, you can sponsor them for as long or as short as you like, but the idea is to make their village and their family self-sufficient. It takes four to seven years typically. Uh, if you pick up one of those picture folders, just fill out the form there and uh, leave the form with whoever's at the table and take the picture home. And in about two weeks, you'll get an updated picture. You'll be able to co start corresponding with your child. Um, and everything I had written, Lucas, he had every letter right there. And that was a bit convicting because I, I don't have all his letters. You know, I didn't save them. But that's the impact. Every verse I had given him, he knew every verse I had written him. He knew every one. Um, because they're hanging on... Our, our words, um, unlike here where they'll stone you if you say so. <laughs> but that's my point. There are people who are thirsty for God's word. We have to find them and sow the light of Jesus there. Um, so great. Uh, there are also a few end times books on the back there. There's a Revelation Decipher, the best book I've read on the book of Revelation. Revelation is extremely challenging. It's the final exam of the Bible. Um, this is a very thorough book, 500 plus pages. Uh, I can't recommend it enough. It's just thorough. He goes through all these Old Testament prophecies, things I couldn't find answers to for years, reading that book, very good. There's also another book called Be Not Deceived, and it's about studying the Bible and allowing yourself to comp use Scripture to compare with Scripture so that you get the accurate interpretations. And I think we're, get we're getting away from that as a church of actually looking to see what the Scripture says about something in, in its totality. We take a verse and we run with it, and we don't know all of the verses that it contradicts. So great book there, too. Thank you so much. Uh, your desire to be a blessing to your community has resulted in being able to allow me to go over there and partner with you guys and, and share with those prisoners. And I'll tell you what, I, I can't express how grateful they are. Almost to a man, they came up to me and said, tell that church thank you, and we're, we're so blessed and that they did this for us, because nobody, nobody thinks about them. They're forgotten believers or a forgotten part of the church. So thank you for doing that and putting that on your heart. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for revealing yourself, your plan for man, your plan to restore us all, Lord your plan to draw us right back into relationship with you. Thank you for revealing that in your word. Thank you for showing us. Thank you for allowing us to be alive right here in this time, Lord. Open our eyes and our hearts and our minds, Lord, so that we can see more clearly, so that we not only understand you and what your plan is and what we need to be doing to be a part of it, but we understand because we know what's coming next how to prepare ourselves and others around us, Lord. Cause us to grow deep and close to you and cause that, that growth to produce fruit, the fruit of love, of compassion, of discernment, of wisdom. Help us to see more clearly, Lord, who you are and what you're about to do. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm supposed to dismiss you. Dismissed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>